very good evening sir uh, well it's pleasure to have you once again uh, meeting up and uh, getting a uh, few uh, things which you have done in the past about nal so that you know we can tell the whole world what's happening okay nal is a research and technology development lab and normally addresses technologies with a high science content and uh, over the years nal has also uh, had the opportunity to set up a lot of facilities at the national level so this combination of uh, unique skill sets and uh, facilities at the national level has enabled it to deliver products and technologies for almost all the indian national aerospace programs be it missiles launch vehicles aircraft etc right sir so that's in general about uh, nal and how the uh, how you have evolved in the last say probably 50 years actually correct okay uh, the 300 crores what we have read in the newspapers it was uh, was estimated and requested but uh, since uh, you know the way the aviation cycles went down the government the previous government had uh, reluctance to actually release the money though we completed the feasibility study report as mandated by the government okay. and suggested that an aircraft for regional transportation in the 70 to 100 seater category should be built for the country okay but uh, the actual sanction of funds have yet to happen okay okay so it is not uh, what we read in the newspapers uh, you you say was not that was the recommendation made by the okay it is not it was not in approval it was a recommendation it was not approved by the government or the money sanction okay okay now i get it as i mentioned earlier being a, one of the biggest engineering and technology development labs in the country we did not want to do what's being done generally by other groups like hobbies we wanted to really understand the physics the flight physics of these small vehicles because low renal number physics is very different from the aerodynamics and flight dynamics of larger scale vehicles so we have put in a lot of effort to try and understand the flight physics at a very fundamental level and have set up facilities for example aerodynamics research tunnel for mavs called mart okay which has very special features that are ideally suited for this class of vehicles right. and it has also got excellent instrumentation facilities uh low capacity balances to measure the forces which are now in grams okay yes uh, instead of kilograms and tons which we do on our larger scale wind tunnels and associated uh, instrument which was also displayed uh, a model was displayed at the air india, india. Yes. so we do a lot of research in trying to understand the, thing. the other challenge in this class of vehicles has been how do you reduce the weight how do you minimize the power and uh, you know meet the volume requirements of these airframes so even on the system side a lot of effort is gone into developing our own indigenous autopilot solutions starting from mems based uh, sensors chipsets and today we have an autopilot that is as good as the best in the world yes sir that i have seen today i have seen pushpak mav fully autonomous mm -hmm. flying today that was one of the most impressive uh, flights in the whole today uh, today's show uh as you have noticed that this class of vehicles seem to have a large range of applications both in the civilian and strategic sectors and uh, as a configuration we feel that uh, given the simplicity and the clean configuration that we have evolved it has a lot of potential in terms of uh, 
not only accommodating the various uh, systems as well as uh, payloads. So I feel that uh, this is a configuration that has a lot of promise and can be scaled up from anything being from about 200 millimeters to 450 millimeters depending on the sort of uh, range and the type of payloads that we want to mount, keeping the basic configuration the same. Right, sir. Actually, as I've been saying, that we are not in the business of actually manufacturing vehicles in large numbers. Yes. We are more interested in understanding the various technologies that go into this class of vehicles, be it systems, uh, be it uh, the airframes, be it the materials that go into the airframes. We have also mounted a very a big, try to establish a group to address looking at eco-friendly materials. Okay. Nowadays we use Kevlar or glass fiber composites or carbon composites. Such uh, composite materials are, as you know, not easily Easy degradable. Yes. And hence we have also looked at, since these class of vehicles do not need that, you know, uh, sort of uh, strength and uh, uh, other structural characteristics, it would be possible to have eco-friendly natural fibers to reinforce the resins right, and, I think, and arrive at a structure which is not only meets the requirements of the user but also has the eco-friendly green technologies embedded in. Uh, not the main anything but today we are expected to earn a percentage of our uh, salaries <laughs> and in that uh, connection we are interested in making products that are marketable but we are not in the game of producing them in large numbers so if you uh, have an opportunity to at least do the demonstration do penetration into the market at least for the basic models what you have created in terms of prototypes so you have that ability and the opportunity within your NAL and MAV team to penetrate. Yeah, we don't want to stop just at the prototype level. We would also like to handhold with whomever we are going to work with for a limited series production. We have done that effectively even on the LCA program. The major 13 major components for even the series production of the light combat aircraft is still being produced by NAL. By, by NAL. Of course, now we have slowly transferring the expertise and technology to the Tata Advance materials. Okay. But we would not uh, you know, shy away from hand-holding the partner even for a limited series production, but not for large number uh, production. That exactly. And that has not been a mandate. We have to also continue to look at advanced technologies for the future. So we do not want to get bogged down by routine production of such vehicles in large numbers. Which means if you have an opportunity to uh, in, uh, or rather increase your infrastructure capabilities and increase your manpower, I'm sure you, you are able to take uh, large numbers. Yeah, currently as you know because of the austerity measures of the government, plus restrictions of expansion in the government sector, we have not been able to scale up. And uh, in some areas, we are finding it difficult to even retain our critical mass. So given that scenario, uh, as I said, whenever it comes to routine production or manufacture, yes. it's also the government's intent that such activity should be handed over to the private sector wherever possible and encourage MSMEs to produce, produce their, their numbers. numbers. All right. I think you have raised a very important point because uh, it's not going to be easy to integrate unmanned air vehicles into a manned air space and with it all its uh, attendant safety and collateral damage issues. So I think uh, it's a very important point and I think even across the world if you see there are hardly four or five countries that have evolved with regulations, uh, with re regulations that can allow 
integration of uh, at least smaller scale unmanned air vehicles with the, the civilian airspace. Right. Sir. And uh, I'm sure that if we really critically look at what has been evolved across the globe in this area and then judiciously adapt, adopt some of these regulations to suit our own, uh, you know, India has certain unique ways of adaptability. In, yes. But I think rather than reinventing the wheel, since a lot of countries have looked at this problem over the years, I think a good starting point would be to do a critical gap analysis of the various solutions that have been provided by the other countries. I think it's Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Zealand Canada, Canada and Britain, US. US now just recently, recently, 15th uh, February. Right. The, they have so come. I think this would be one way to start up with. Right. I think one of the major problems that we have been facing as a country is that we do not have a supply chain mechanism for mm -hmm. various components that go even in this smaller class of uh, vehicles, right. be it actuators, be it sensors, be it uh, onboard electronics, to, uh, like the power supply and all that. So most of the components that get into the aircraft are currently being imported and this also includes the material like uh, Kevlar or the Preprex. So there is a large import content that is, uh, you know, utilized in making these vehicles. And because of various uh, strategic reasons, we are the class of materials that are easily available to most of the design houses in the country sure. are of the hobby class. Very true. Whereas if you look at many of the strategic applications and also taking the collateral damage of even a small vehicle coming and suddenly striking someone on ground, it becomes important that we ensure a minimum level of safety, flight safety, right. flight safety and reliability in the system. And since uh, the power budgets, the volume and weight are so small, redundancy is not a solution like in bigger vehicles, wherein we make it multi-redundant and in such a way handle failures. Mm -hmm. So the basic component that you mount should have a minimum time between failures, what we call the MTBS. Yes, right. And that class of components for this class of vehicles is still not easily available and therefore when we produce vehicles in numbers we find that you know we are not able to give the users a uniform quality across the numbers right and that has been one of the biggest uh, challenges but i am very uh, you know what do you call uh, Sh candid show sure. you know i Think things are changing, especially with mobile phone technology, wearable devices. That so it's uh, very much easy these days uh, to, to you know see. innovate yes. and reuse some of the sensors, uh, even including payloads, the cameras that are coming up on these devices. The models that are made are detachable models. If there's a crash, whatever it is, you pick up the best ones. You can reuse them. Exactly. That's that's pretty much well. Well, that was about uh, the uh, technical aspects and all those things, sir. Uh, I have been in NAL for nearly 37 years and it has been a very exciting journey because I work basically in the area of flight dynamics and control and I have been associated with practically every major program in the country, be it missiles, launch vehicles or aircraft and uh, as you know, uh, controlling these class of vehicles is a big a challenge. But what I have noticed across the years is when I joined NAL, we were in a position to attract the best of talent because there were hardly any other organizations in the aerospace domain that, time. that provided an opportunity for the best in the country to join. But over the years, due to the expansion in other government departments as well as in the private and public sector, attracting talent into NAL today has become the greatest challenge and not only getting them into the system but retaining, retaining the talent over the years because as you know practically every major OEM in the world, be it engine, airframe or systems, has started uh, operations in the uh, country. So yes. I think the biggest challenge that we are facing is how do we get continue to get 
the best manpower <laughs> uh, and keeping the various constraints of the government sector that's one of the challenges and that's one of seen. the challenges we have to look for innovative mix of working with other organizations and uh, there is a group of uh, youngsters who do not look at pay scales and promotions as the main thing if you are able to attract them by giving them very you know innovative and challenging uh, projects work, yes and that will you know not only help Retain us them. attract i think the department of space has clearly shown that we'll focus on that <laughs> so similarly i feel even in aeronautics if we have a good range of projects which we have today we will be in a position to attract enough number of youngsters to contribute to this national That's effort That's amazing sir Now what I would like to uh, suggest or even recommend is that we somehow have to synergize the large pools of talent that we have distributed across various sectors be it the private public and the government sector i think this is an area where a fundamental understanding of the various uh, not only the aerodynamics but the structures and the systems is needed and that cannot be done by a single organization especially keeping in mind the way technology is advancing so we have to keep pace not only catch up with the rest of the world but also keep pace with That's technology very important point you said and hence that can only happen if we all put our efforts together clearly identify and delineate our responsibilities and skill sets and devote whatever limited talent pools we have towards specific problems and address the needs of the country uh, for the future right sir i think that's a brilliant advice what you have given i'm sure we all should be able to follow that thank you very much for your time sir i'm sure we will see a new nal in the near future as well as a new generation taking up a very good uh, pace what you just mentioned thank you very much sir it's my pleasure